You didn't tell me you couldn't hear me. You couldn't hear me the whole time. I cannot believe that. God bless you. Like I said, welcome. We're here to study God's word. Um, you saw my lips moving, but now you hear me actually he's talking to you. And I'm saying, welcome to the ride. Every Friday night I'm here. I try to um, get on and study the word. We're in Exodus. And I just told you that chapter one was an amazing chapter. Uh, it let us know that the same program that they had going on in Egypt to, to weaken the community, the Hebrew Israelite community, was going on in America. They said, kill the boys, kill the boys, and let the ladies live. Kill the boys and let the girls live. That was their program. And our program is still kill the boys. It's still the program to reduce us, to reduce our strength, the program to reduce our communities is kill the men, get them out of the way, and let the ladies live. What, what, the welfare and all these other kinds of stuff? I just don't know. It's a crazy situation. But we are here to study God's word. And, and you need to know that God's word is so relevant, especially right up through here. Now, last time I talked to you about how that there was this man and this woman, these two Levite uh, people, men and women, who had a baby. And now the, 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 the Pharaoh told everybody in the land, kill all the male children, throw them into the river, but let the la ladies live. Oh, excuse me. And it was very specific. It wasn't just kill the Egyptian boys. It was kill the Hebrew Israelites. Kill the the, the descendants of uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Kill them. Kill their boys and let them live. I guess they wanted to incorporate the women in, but God said it was it's just really strange. The more they oppress the people, the more harder they treated them, the more worse they treat them. You know what happened? Instead of decreasing, they increase. They multiply. We give God thanks for that. We give thanks for uh, um, the two women uh, who were the midwives who refused to, oh, they, they actually refused to let Pharaoh tell them what to do. It, was, it would be like us, you know, saying, uh, President, Mr. President, we ain't doing nothing that you said. And because uh, because we just believe in something more higher than you. Now, that's what they said. They didn't say it like that. They just said, hey, them Hebrew women, they had their babies so fast, we can't even get to them fast enough. So they are lively women. And I can say that about the, the uh, Hebrew Israelite women, that's what the scripture said, but I can say that about the women of the sinners of the American slave, the, the women of color, the women of all races. Women are strong, way stronger than we are in many cases. Yet they have some differences in us. Some of them may not be as physically strong, but you check their emotion, you check their spirit, you check their thinking, you check their, their what they're doing to hold up their families, they are strong. Big up to the sisters. God bless these sisters. Keep on rolling on. Keep on uh, loving these men and keep on having these babies and see, see won't God bless you. Because he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Keep up the good job. I celebrate you today. Now, last week we talked about seeing things. Seeing things. Now we know that uh, Moses lived 40 years in Pharaoh's house. He lived 40 years in that palace. He lived, he lived the Cush life. He, you know, the Prince of Bel Air had nothing on Brother Moses. He was living the best life he could possibly in the world and a world power. He was living the prince. God, God, God delivered him from being killed. And now God is about to bring the deliverer into his assignment. So I want you to continuously look throughout your life. Just as Moses was on the backside of the desert looking and all of a sudden he noticed something that was very different. It was, it was something unusual, something different, something extraordinary that he hadn't seen. Now he had been out there, um, he had been out there doing this shepherd thing for almost 40 years. Now you see, God gets you prepared for what you get ready to deal with. He was already in Pharaoh's, let me say that again. That's, a, that's something I want to say. God gets you prepared for what the plan that he has for your life. Now you gotta know that all this time, this 400 years, God was working on a plan for the Hebrew Israelites. I'm gonna deliver them, I'm gonna save them, they don't know it. And for most of the time, it looked like God wasn't even listening to them. They were 400 years under oppression and God, like, oh my God, will God ever come and deliver? Will God ever hear us? I'll come to tell you today, God hears and answers prayer that's one of my that's one of the things i love the most about the god that we have that we, we serve a living god and he hears and he answers prayer now this god who hears and answers prayer also is what i call the great coordinator he's always behind the scenes with they what they call providence working things out for his children 
Now, I was I was upset with God last week. I just, to be honest with you, I was like, now, 400 years, Lord? How, how, how long do we have to wait for you to come and do something about this situation? And so and then, then I, I got to give up, give big up to uh, to Reverend Leon Brooks. That's one of my, my uh, accountability brothers, a good brother. He said, brother, I'm a mathematician. I think you got it twisted. You're over here complaining about God doing something in 400 years and he taking too long. And yeah, I said, yeah, I, I am. I'm, I'm kind of upset about that. I don't know about you, but I want things to be done tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. I want to be done yesterday. If I add it, I want it done yesterday. And especially because we live in this microwave society, we can eat our dinner in three minutes. Bam, can't you do something for cooking in that? So, so, you know, I was in that complaining mode because I want God to deliver up his people. But then my brother said, look, look, here's the math. He said, Omar, doesn't the Bible say that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day with the Lord? So I just want you to think about that. He said, I did the math and I broke it down. And then, you know, I have a little mathematical mind too. I was like, boop, 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 boop. And I said, my head went down. He was like, what's up, bro? what's up, Omar? He said, that, that, that 400 years, a little bit of time, isn't it, compared to in God's kind of time. See, we are on man time. We are on our time, and we know our time is limited. You know, if we if we get to 100 years, 120 years, we, we know it ain't got that much more. We won't have 120 more. I don't know too many people living 200 years now, 300 years now. You know, so I do know we have some, um, some uh, what they call them, centenarians, people who lived 100 years, and I'm going to be one of them. I'm planning to live at least about 107, somewhere like that. 107, I might ready, be ready to give it up. But at the end of the day, our God sees 100 years like it was a flash to him. It was nothing. And then I had to go back and think about this a, a little bit more deeper. I realized that all that time that God was working, well, while the people were in, in, in Egypt going through that thing, God was working on something. He, got, he picked up a man, Abraham. Got Abraham going. Got, then that Abraham had a son named Isaac. Got Isaac going. Now Isaac had, had a son named Jacob. He had a couple of Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob had 12 of them. And then a whole tribe came into being. And then God knew they were going to be going through some stuff. And so he set up a situation. He had one guy, one of his sons, one, one of uh, um, Jacob's sons. All the brothers got jealous at him because he could interpret dreams. He, they were like, we can't stand you. How, how daddy gonna give you a nice coat and not give her? God, daddy playing favorites with you. We don't, we don't like that. And, and you telling us a dream that we all gonna bow down to you, he said. And, and, and you know, Joseph, he must have been a young, because he was like saying that to his brothers and brothers like, mm -hmm. okay, we see how that work out. And you know what they did? They threw brother Joseph into a well to be sold to the Midians. Oh my goodness, this is interesting how God is bringing this whole thing back. To be sold to some, some other people as a slave. That brother went into that slavery, was in the palace, and then God saw him, God used him in prison to interpret the dream of Pharaoh, and he became second in command to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. God was working this thing out now. Sometimes it looked like you could see him big, God doing big things, you know, all these people coming out of Egypt. They say it's like 1.5 million, something like that, of people came out of Egypt when they went into uh, on their journey to the promised land. So, so God was multiplying the people. God was watching over them. God was preparing them. God was preparing a deliverer. And when, the, when, when, the, when, the, um, when I almost said the SHIT hit the fan, but that's not what I want to say. But when, when the Pharaoh turned up the heat, on the Hebrew Israelite people and was making their life miserable, putting taskmasters over them, did not giving them any respect as a human being, just dogging them out. As, they was, as, the, as the Pharaoh was turning that up, God was getting this program together. In fact, the very program that he would say, throw the boys in the river, and this one faithful family, these two Levites, they didn't throw the boy in the river, they put him in a little basket, and they, like an ark, and put him on the road. And, and God used that timing. I mean, you got to know that God's timing is, imp is impeccable because then Pharaoh's daughter is coming out at that time and see this baby and hear, see the bucket, hear the baby crying. And the first thing Moses did was, Wah! that's why they had to get rid of him because they couldn't keep the, big, the child hidden anymore. They, were, they hid that child for at least three months, but after a while they couldn't do it anymore and they had to do something. So they might have a, might have had a lapse of faith. We're going to throw them in the river, but we're going to do it our way. We're not going to just throw them in the river. We're going we're gonna to try to make a fish. And then God sent Pharaoh's daughter to bring him out and to bring him in his house. Now, if you're following this and you're following how I have these parallels going on, Pharaoh's daughter is not a Hebrew Israelite. 
Pharaoh's daughter is of the wealthy elite class. She knew what her father had done. Her father had put this decree on and was killing all these boys and she had some compassion on it. And she brought one of those boys into the house. Some people say by her bringing that boy into the house, that whole, that whole campaign of killing all the boys went down. Because if, if the Pharaoh can't even get his own daughter <laughs> under subjection and the father rule, then you know the whole the country not gonna do it. And so during the life of Moses, they got a little bit of a break, at least one of them did. And we, we love how God set the whole thing up and had Moses' mother take, nurse him. Amazing. God, God had it set up so Moses' mother got paid to nurse Moses. <laughs> won't he do it? Now, remember I did that sermon. Y'all got to look at the other ones I talked about. Won't, won't he do it? Yes, he will. God will work things out on your behalf. Now, we're at this chapter three. We're at the beginning of them. We're looking out. We're looking out on the horizon. And Moses is walking around on the horizon. 40 years on the, on the dark side of the day. 40 years as a shepherd. Because he was going to shepherd. Now, that's what I was trying to get to. God let him be a shepherd because he was going to shepherd God's people. He got whatever amount of flock he got. Now he got a, he got a shepherd of flock. He got to be a pastor, a shepherd of a flock of human beings coming out of a crazy situation, slave mentality and all that. So, 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 and then God also had him live in the house. So when, when Moses came back and ate Egypt, he was like, he was back at home, really. He already knew, this, he already knew how to get in. He knew who to talk to, he knew how to work, what was it. So God had already prepared them. What is God preparing you for? Look at your life. Take, take a good look at your life and say, what is God preparing me for? And, and all the things that God prepared you, the user to prepare you, they ain't always looking good or smelling good either. You know, in my case, um, before I got uh, the opportunity and, and led by God to lead a ministry downtown, big up to Bishop Kenneth Ullman, Faithful Central Bible Church, they had, the, they had the vision to do something with the homeless people downtown, and they picked me. Now, just before that time happened, I was already homeless for about 18 months when I got the call to come and serve. So, so when I said to the people, I understand what it is to be homeless with your family, your wife, your children, and your dog, trying to keep everything together, working three jobs. I understand how it is, brothers out there, brothers and sisters out there. I was working three jobs. I'm telling you, I was working three jobs and wasn't making one full-time income. Uber, ch chess tutors, and, uh, and what else would I do? Uber, chess tutors, and something else. Oh, oh and teaching at a university. None of them made enough money for me to really put it together for my family. So we had to go through that experience. And now I would not, first of all, I'll say this, I would not wish that on any person. Some of y'all want to be quick to be a pastor. Some of y'all want to be quick to be led by God and used of God. But you're going to have to, you going to have to, uh, in order to enjoy God's glory, you might have to uh, uh, endure a story. You may have to get a testimony and, and go through some tests so you have something to, to share with people when you come out. I'm so thankful. It's been been a couple of years now. You know, never late, never missed. I'm giving testimony. Glory unto God. I'm a brag on God. God hooked us up on the very first day that we opened up the church downtown. With the very first day, I had keys in my hand to go into a house. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> when I think about the goodness of the Lord and how good he's been to me, it makes me want to shout, y'all. Come on now. Somebody need to share this with somebody else. Somebody needs to say, be encouraged. Don't give up. Don't quit. Hang in there. God is working out a testimony. God's getting you all set up, getting everything you need so that you can be a blessing. They say if the person who goes through great pain is the person who's going to have a great ministry. If you want to have great ministry, doing great things, you have to go through some things. And guess what? God will be there with you. I, I went up in the mountain and fussed that guy. I talked about, oh, you, don't you see who I am? Don't you say, you a father, I'm a father. Can you help me? And then you know what? The, that's that day I had that big shout out with God. I, I, oh, man, I gave God the, the business. I don't know. Y'all may not have a relationship with that like that with God. But I gave God the business. I told him, I ain't going to church no more. I had too much church hurt, too much church pain. Any of y'all got church hurt and pain? Oh, my God. I, I can help you with some of that because the guy had to heal you from that church hurt. Sometimes the, the pain from the church, the hurt from the church is so painful that we don't even want to come back to anybody's church anymore. But God had a plan for my life. And that very day I was up there fussing that God, God had somebody hearing a message over at Faithful Central Bible Church, my two or two of the people that I ministered to. Big shout out to Ron Dell, Pastor Ron Dell and his lovely wife and, and, and baby Dell. Yeah, so big shout. They heard 
bishop announcing about a job that I was the one who was called. They said, tell, tell Pastor Omar, we just heard um, Bishop Omar or Alma talk about his job. And I didn't know at the time. My wife asked, would you going to do something about it? I was like, I just got, no, I, I'm not doing anything about it because I just got finished talking to God. And I told her, I'm through. I'll send my children to church, but I'm done. And on that very day, I get a call about a position that was opening downtown. I had already been working downtown. I knew how to do homeless ministry before. And I get that call. And then my wife said, you going to do it? I was like, nah, I don't, know. I don't think so. But as I was coming down the mountain, walking with my dog, Sheba, as I'm coming down the mountain, God started downloading into my mind. He said, don't you remember when you worked downtown before and you wanted to be a chaplain? I'm giving you an opportunity to not come back as a chaplain, but as a pastor. Don't you remember that? And then he said, and then he said, and then, and what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to give you a download. Broop, he gave me a download. When I came, when I got back to my house, we, we were staying in Pomona. When I got back to the house, I had already had a ministry plan in my head that God did. And when I sat down on my laptop, broop, it came out. Eventually, I presented that to, to the bishop, went through all the, the, the you know, because they don't play over that faithful center. They're going, they're going to sift you and see if you really cut the mustard to be with, to be a minister and work with them. And uh, thank God the testimony was, your, your ministry has been impeccable. Come on, bro, we're gonna invite you in. I got ordained by Bishop Kenneth C. Ohm. I don't know how many people can say that. In fact, this Bible right here I'm using, this is the Bible he gave me on the day I got ordained. I'm so thankful to be under such great leadership a teaching man like myself. And so I don't want to take up all your time. You say, I thought this was a Bible study. You gave the testimony. Let's get into that word. All right. Now, I, I'd like to introduce to you some things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen with you right now. And uh, what these are I'm about to share with you are not Facebook. I'm on Facebook, but that's not what I'm trying to share with you. I'm trying to deal with you, share with you, first of all, this tool here. This is the Bible. It's the NET Bible, one of my favorite, one of my favorite Bibles I'm using right now. Uh, it's a study Bible. You can do a lot with it. And I encourage you to actually um, get this NET Bible. You can look it up and you'll get that right up there. You see, get that. The other tool I want to show you is this one. I use something called the Blue Letter Bible. You can take any word in the Bible. You can type it in here and you can, we can find that word. So one of the words we're going to deal with today is, let's, let, me, let me pick a word out of Genesis chapter three. Uh, how about this word? How about the word um, Jethro? Now, I'm going to type in the word, it's a name, actually, J-E-T-H-R-O, Jethro. Jethro can be found in Genesis, I mean, uh, um, Leviticus chapter 3, verse 1. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Medan, and he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. Okay, so, so let, me put, let me type Jethro in here and just see if this thing will look it up. Okay, uh, I need you to look up the word Jethro for me. J-E-T-H-R-O. All right, what you gonna do? What you got for me? Well, look -a here, Jethro. Here's it. Now, I don't know how many times. It said Jethro has been in, used in the Bible 10 times. Nine verses in the King James Accord, uh, including nine exact phrases shown below. Look down here. Here's where Jethro is at. And I think this is the first time it's mentioned. So this is the first time we're uh, in, encountering this name Jethro. And he's the father-in-law of Moses. He's Zipporah's father. So, so, so this dude gave Je Moses a job, but he came out there and helped his daughters uh, fight off those other people. Jethro gave Moses a job while he was out in the wilderness. So I thank God for Jethro. So here's what you do. You use this tool here, click on it right here. And then, it, and then it breaks this down. So some people say, I can't study the Bible. I can't read Hebrew. You don't have to read Hebrew anymore. The Hebrew is right here. Moshe. Now listen to this. Y'all don't even know this. Let me, let, me, let me have this pronounce this for you. Listen, this is Hebrew. Listen. Strong's 4872. Moshe. 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 This is how you say a Moses' name in Hebrew. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out a challenge. Somebody might be able to kick me up on this challenge. Next week, I want you guys to do this. Somebody tell me if they could do some research. What is Moses' real name? Now, you, you know that Pharaoh named Moses. But I wonder, are there any writings anywhere among the Jewish work or literature what Moses' real name is? 
I, I put that out of the challenge. Bring that to me next week, and, and maybe I'll find it too. So here, here's Moses. His name equals drawn. Remember, we talked about that. His name equals drawn, and it means, um, and, then, and then you see Moshe it comes drawn out of the water, uh, i.e. rescued Moshe. So his name is telling you a, bit, a lot of his story. Moshe, I took him out of the water. I saved him from destruction. I, and, uh, you know, that's a big up to his, uh, to his stepmother, Pharaoh's daughter. And then you'll read a little bit more about it. In this paper, I don't know if I can, I don't think I can make it big, but I can read it here. It says, Moses, the great leader, legislator, and prophet of the Israelite, the son of Amram, of the tribe of Levi, whose actions are narrated in the four letter, the four latter books of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is five, five Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses shows up in here, and then he influenced all the rest of the things that are going on. So there it is. So that's one way. But we didn't come here to look at uh, Moses' name. We came here to check out Jethro. So let's go back. Remember, we had Jethro. We looked at that. You can see how we can look it up and see different names. Let's see if it's on here. Uh, let's see. There it is, Korab. We have to go to the next verse. No, not yet. Let's go back to this one. Oh, there it is, Jethro. Here's the name Jethro. We say Jethro in English. Let's hear how the Hebrews say it. Strong's H, 3503. Yether. 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 It don't even sound like Jethro. <laughs> Yether. All right, good. Here's, let's see what the word name means. Yethro. Um, in fact, this guy, Yet, um, he has several names in the Bible. Uh, uh, it's not just Jethro. This is one of his names. So Jethro, that name means his abundance. What a great name. What, what a great name. Jethro equals his abundance. Who's his? God's abundance. So he's, he, so, so God um, allowed uh, Moses to have some sense of abundance being in Jethro's house. Now, Jethro was also abundant. He had seven daughters. He, you know, he's the Abu Bini for sure. Abu is Arabic for father, Bini, daughter. So he's the father of daughters. He's a true Abu Bini. And, you know, you got to be a special to be an Abu Bini to actually have daughters. You know, I thought God was going to not ever let me have a daughter. I had one baby, boy, one baby, boy, two baby. I wasn't mad, though. Thank God for y'all son, the firstborn, Emmanuel. One boy, two boy, three boy. I was like, ah, oh, man, Lord, you're not going to let me have a go. What did what did I do? I, ain't, I, I have a soft enough heart. And then God felt, gave me, uh, oh, oh, we call this baby the stop sign. <laughs> yeah, we call it a stop sign. So she, she came. And I thank God for it. So I'm a, I'm a Abu Bini now, a father of a daughter. Thank God. It's nothing like it. So all we find out about this man's name is that uh, it has to do with abundance. 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 So that's how you, that's how you use this tool. If there's anybody, any name in the Bible that you're looking for and you're trying to study, uh, you can look up that name. You can get that tool I just showed you, the Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible, it's at blueletterbible.org. You can look it up. You can type in anything in that section I showed you uh, at the top of it. Let me go share the screen again. Right here at the top of it, where it says verses of word. Now you can put a you can put a verse in there. You can put a you can put a verses in there you're trying to find. You, say you don't know a word. You, try, you know there's something in the Bible. There's something in the Bible called whatever it is. And you can type that word in there, and then if it's actually in the Bible, it'll give you the actual um um, verses for that. So let's stay with it. Let's move a little bit further. So that so so that one day Moses, what, what do we learn Moses' name then? Moses' name meant right. I heard you. Yes, to to draw out, to draw. Out. So 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 one day Moses, the one who was drawn out, was tending his flock, the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. The flock of the father-in-law. His name means abundance. The priest of Midian. He led, he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain. That, 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 that one verse right there is full of a whole lot of things because it's saying that he was a priest. Uh, I don't want to be here long, but I'm going to just show you. Here's this other one. So he, was, he, he turns out he's a priest. Let me make sure I'm sharing it with you properly. I don't think I did it right. Let me properly share this with you. There it is. Share. <laughs> Here we go. We're back again. So I'm sharing with you my, my, my 
my, my uh, digital Bible. This is the one I use. It's called a, a digital Bible. And it says this. It's slightly different than the King James Version. That, the other one is King James mostly. And it says, now Moses. Let me move the screen over a little bit more. Uh, let me get it over there. There we go. There we go. There we go. Put this in the back. I'm going to bring this up right here. Now Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Medan, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, Hori. Now, Horeb. Now, what does that word Horeb mean? Now, now that's one I would want to start and look at. So, remember how I told you? I would go here. I'm going to dial it up again because I lost it. Here it is. Blue letter Bible. Blue letter Bible. Blue letter Bible. Here it is. Blue letter Bible. Now, we want to check this out right quick. You know, we, now, we, we have an idea what a priest is. So God sent Moses uh, to a priest. Now, the question is, was he a priest of God? We don't know. I'm assuming because, because how God used him, I think he was a priest. And, he, and, he, and God, he had a revelation of God that, that predated the revelation that God gave to Moses and his people. Uh, but he had a revelation, and he was a priest. So he's there. So then we have this, this thing now. In my version here, it might be in your version. Let me see what the King James Version says. Let's go back to this. Um, remember I told you you can do it like this. My Bible is already set up for it. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus. I'm going to go to 2. No, nope. Exodus. Put the wrong thing in there. You can't get the right place if you put the wrong thing in. E-X-O-D-U-S. Exodus 3. That's where I want to go. Back to here. Click on it right here. Exodus 3 should come up in just a moment as I go, say, go. You have to go say, tell it, go, go, go get it. Go get Exodus for me. Go get, see, you're a good servant. Thank you, thank you, Blue Letter Bible. Exodus chapter 3. And now we, I was talking to you about this. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Medan, and he had led the flock into the backside of the desert and came to the mountain, even Horeb. Let's look at Horeb. Remember, you see I use it too. Click on that side over there. Go down to the word, Horab. Go over here. Let's see what it is. The Hebrews say it probably different than we do. Let's see what they say. Strong's H, 2722. Horav. 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 This is how it's Second like. entry. Horav. 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 This is how I practice my Hebrew and stay connected to it. But let's see what the word means now. The word is a part of speech. It's a Horab. It's a noun. But what does that now mean? Horeb, the desert. <laughs> so this is the mountain in the desert. All right. So this is a desert mountain. Another name for Mount Sinai, from which God gave the law to Moses and the Israelites. So this spot that Moses is at right now, this, is going to, this spot is going to be huge. Because, you know, Moses is going to go, go to Egypt, deliver the people, and come right back to this spot. The same spot that he was looking on the horizon and saw something strange and draw his attention to it. So I want you to look in your life. If there's th is there some th strange things happening in your life, if there's some things you just really don't understand, come on and get with God and let him show you because it might be the fire of God. Now, my time is running short, so let me see. How far can I go with you guys today? Let me see if I can take you a little bit further. All right, let's do this. Go back to the text. Now we know that the, mount uh, the mountain of God, this mountain of God to Horeb, it's the mountain of God, the big mountain in the desert. And they said the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of a fire within a bush. He looked and the bush was ablaze with fire, but it was not being consumed. So Moses thought, I will turn aside and see this amazing sight. Why does this bush not burn up? Now, you know he's seen bushes burn in the, in the desert many times. So he said, I want to turn and see this amazing sight. Now, let me show you how to use some Bible notes. This is a Bible. Here's Bible notes. All these little numbers right here, these little blue numbers, they are not... Um, they are not, uh, they're not verses. This dark one is a verse. This is verse three. There are numbers that, that go, to a, um, like go to a note over here. So I'm going to click on this number, amazing. I want to see what that word means. Here's a note for the word amazing. Look, he says, it's a Hebrew word. It means great. The word means something extraordinary here. And using this term, Moses revealed his reaction to the strange sight and his anticipation that something special was about to happen. So he turned away from the flock to investigate. I know we had a, I know we had a big, 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 big hurry to get out of 2020. But it, 
if, if 2020 is not a strange sight, I don't know what is. So, so there may be something. If we look a little bit closer at the strangeness and the weirdness of people walking around with masks and, and, and you know, being made to stay at home, churches being closed down, all this stuff, there is something strange going on. And if I were you, I'd be looking at the horizon of my life and saying, what is going on? What is God trying to do? One of the things that happened to me while I was while we were going through the COVID that I had I had I had a, a, a deep impression that I should go back to school. I called the school. I put in the application some time ago, and I called the school. They said if you get your application in here by the end of this week, you can get in. I am now a PhD student at Claremont Graduate University during COVID. During COVID. I didn't let COVID put me into a box and say, I can't do nothing. I'll wait till everything get back. No, God let me take new territory during COVID. I think God got something for you. I think God got something for you so big. It's like this. And I want you to start looking at it. Look at that strange thing. And when you see it, come and say, the word means something extraordinary here. And using this term, Moses revealed his reaction to the strange sight and his anticipation that something special was about to happen. So he turned away from the flock to investigate. He left his responsibility of those sheep to go and see what God was, and he didn't know God was over there, but we, we, got a, we got a little glimpse of what's over there. What did we see? What did the scripture say for us? It says, he looked at the bush with fire and was not being burned. So Moses thought, I will turn aside and see this amazing thing, why this bush did not burn up. And when the Lord, say the Lord, the Lord. Whenever you see this capital L, capital O, capital R, D, that's the big Lord. That's not, that's, that's the I am that is. That's the Yahweh. That, that's no, that's a covenant name. That's no, that's no weak name. Let me click on 15 to see if they do anything with that. Click on 15. Uh oh. The, yeah, it goes here. It goes, uh, here's some um, grammatical, grammatical stuff, but it says, uh, the point of the verse that God called to him, the language is anthropomorphic as if God's actions were based on observing what Moses did. Now, God doesn't have any hands, but the hands that's on you. God doesn't have any eyes, but the eyes that you're looking through. God doesn't have any mouth, but the mouth that you speak through. God doesn't have a body, but the body that you're in. And when God wants to do something, he'll make your eyes see what was, what was previously not seen. He will draw you to himself. So look at your life, my friend. That's the day. Take an take a inventory of, that's the word for the day. I'm going to have to get out of here, and we'll come back. Uh, come back next week, but get, take this word with you. Take an inventory of your life. Notice that it's extraordinary. Notice the strange things. Why does the bush not burn up? Ask the questions. Go ahead and start asking the question. What question do you need to ask God for? Is there a question? You might have a question. What should I do next? What does this, what does this layoff mean for me? What does this new, what, is there a new opportunity? What does COVID have to do with me and you, God? Ask God questions. God, it's God said, come, let us uh, reason together, saith the Lord. God loves for you to bring your questions to him. Bring your questions to the Father and see when he do something for you. See when he answer it up. So when Moses had this curious thing, why does the bush not burn up? And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses, I'm, all the drama, I like drama, Moses. He like, now you gotta think about what's happening here. <laughs> Moses on the dark side of the desert, he might even think he might be losing his mind because he saw bushes, but, but this bush, but he go, he leaves his flight, he goes in there and says, I wonder what's going on there. Let me go check it out. Sometimes we have to follow our mind when those questions come up our mind. Do the research. And then when, when and it says when the law at talking and anthro, anthropomorphism is like what we attribute God, like if God had hands, God had eyes, God had mouth. But some kind of way, that fire in the midst of the burning fire, he heard his name, Moses. And then, and then you see it, see, I don't know if this is true or not, but it looked like there's a, um, I don't know if the Hebrew has it, but right here, there's an exclamation point. It's not just Moses, it's Moses, Moses! And Moses said to him, here I am. He just started talking, talking to the fire in the bush. I, I, I had an experience like that where God talked to me and I just, I just, I heard, but it sounded like my voice, but it was not me talking to me. It was God talking to me, but it sounded like my voice. And the scripture said, and when the Lord saw 
he had turned aside to look, God called to him from within the bushes, said Moses. And Moses said, here am I. I, can you say this with me? Here am I. Are you here for God to use you? Are you here for God to do great things for you? Tell God that you're ready. Tell God that you, you see the, the, the strange things he got going on in your life and you want him to give you, want him to give you some clarity. Come to here to God, but don't, don't wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't come flippantly. Don't come like God is your buddy. You, you know, now I told you about how I fussed the guy, but, but, but believe me, I had, I had a 30, 40 year relationship with God talking to him. So, so we had, we had a long-term relationship. He used to me fussing and crying and complaining. <laughs> My wife would say, uh, and Moses said to him, here I am. And the scripture said, God said, don't approach any closer. Take your sandals off your feet for the place that you're standing is holy ground. We're going to leave here on some holy ground. This is my sandal. He said, take your sandals off your feet. And what did Moses do? <laughs> Moses took the sandals off his feet. We're going to find out later on how he, what his response was. We see that he was afraid to look, but that's for another lesson. Listen, this Pastor O. I've been here long enough. Keep your hands clean and your heart pure. Let me go on out of here. Let me let, let, me let you see me full screen again. Uh, how do we do this? Stop share. Move this back. Try, why don't you try this week using some of those Bible tools I showed you? See if you can uh, uh, answer some of your own questions that you have in the mind of God. So I want to just, I'm, I'm going I'm to say a prayer. I think that's what I'm going to do. I have never done this before. But I'm going to say a prayer, and it's prayer for you as we close. But I always like to say, keep your hands clean and your heart pure. You can't go wrong with that. Abba, Father, almighty God, the same God that appeared to Moses as fire in the bush, the same God that made something such a thing that drew Moses to him, the same God that said, Abba, Father, Yahweh, Elohim, Eshadah, I call upon your name and I ask you, Father, on the behalf of those people who will be watching this program, I ask that you have blessed them with abundance. Bless them, that we heard the word abundance. Uh, Father, bless them from your overflow. Let their lives be so full of blessings and favor and honor and that they won't even, that they can't, they can't say anybody else did this but God. So I thank you for how you're gonna bless them. I thank you how you put a hunger and thirst in, their, in, their, in, in, your, um, in them to study your word. Because if you hung out with me this long, you must be a God lover and you want to know more about God. So I, I encourage you, share this with other people. Uh, I'll be back next week. And, uh, and you can find me on any of the social media networks. Type in Omar A. Muhammad. If you found me on Facebook, I'm at Omar A. Muhammad. Uh, you can find me at Omar A. Muhammad, comma, THM. You can find me there and can become a friend. I, I got 5,000 friends, so I can't add you on right now. But if I could, I would. All right. Clean hands, pure heart. That's how we stay in the right place in a transparent society. Peace and blessings. I'm out.